While we're um, while we're, I'm going to go through a review. Um, before I get there, I do want to m make sure that you have. I need you to have a couple of supplies near you, so um, we can you can start grabbing those now if you don't already have them close by. What we need you to have are, are a few sheets of blank paper or notepad, uh, sticky notes if you have them. Um, you know the usual, um, you know, post-it notes, sticky notes would be fine. Um, the paper can have lines on it. That's okay. Just, just have some clean sheets available uh, for you uh, that you haven't written on. If you have access to one of those good um, Sharpie markers, grab one of those too. You may, you may like um, to use that for what we need to do. It will also make it a little bit easier for us to see on screen if you hold something up on camera. If you don't have a Sharpie handy, that's okay. Pen will work. Um, probably pen is going to be best, again, so that we can see it on screen if we ask you to hold something up. Um, and what else? Uh, nope, I think that's it. So paper, uh, clean sheets of paper or post-its, and then uh, some kind of writing utensil, writing instruments. So grab those while, while we go through um, a bit of a review. So remember in the first session, we one of the first things that we set out was to um, delineate the difference between um, idea, this idea of first thinking, this very linear thinking, um, sometimes accompanied with fist pounding on the table of I've got an idea and so we're, I'm going to go develop it, I'm going to make, make it perfect and reveal it to the world and I'm going to expect everybody to love it. In contrast, design thinking as we reminded ourselves, is much more circular in the way that it um, both is, um, is conducted, but then also how it evolves and how our ideas evolve. It is meant to be something that we go um, both through a cycle and a circular motion, but we also have a chance and an opportunity to go back. We intentionally take those opportunities to go back and check um, and validate and uh, and work uh, with um, in a much more inclusive environment where we're revealing our design we're talking about our design much earlier in the process especially as we're empathizing and defining uh, we talked through some of these behaviors uh, these are the, the behaviors that we've covered so far uh, one of the things after i left you guys uh, last week i remembered when i was working in it for a manufacturing company and the uh, industrial engineer on the shop floor, he came uh, to us and he revealed this innovative way that he solved for what was still at that time, and this was only seven years ago, uh, paperwork instructions that they used on the shop floor, these like huge three ring binders that uh, were at each workstation, as you can imagine, on an assembly line or shop floor. And, and every time there was a change to those work instructions, somebody would have to print out the page and deliver it to the workstation uh, to be put in, in, in place in the right binders, in the right place. Uh, you know, it, we'd have to do that um, you know, when there was downtime on the shop floor, the whole deal. And this industrial engineer took some time to move all of the manuals, all those paper manuals to a shared Google Drive so that work instructions no longer needed to even be printed. They could be accessed from any workstation, on any device, anytime from anywhere on the shop floor. Whoops, let's go back, sorry. Um, so it was, it, it, for him, for this industrial engineer, it was process innovation. Yes, he used a product in this case, he used Google Drive and, and the, the, um, the different applications within, within G Suite, but it, really, it was really process innovation for him. And when I asked why he didn't come to us, because I was a, um, an IT leader at the time, I, you know, and it wasn't an accusatory way. It was just a, a legitimately curious way. Like, why didn't you come to us to work on this with you? He said, because I thought you would say no. So that was heartbreaking for us. We had lived up to this reputation as, as being the department of no. 
So yes, and that bottom one, bottom right um, corner there, yes, and became really important for us as we changed our way of engaging and our way of empathizing with, in our, in our case, internal customers. And this idea, this realization for me that this industrial engineer's idea, had he come to us, might have never seen the light of day because we would have said no first rather than um, going through the design thinking process with him. So there's an example of not only how we can use design thinking beyond just um, product innovation, but also this idea of changing um, our mindset. Remember, it's not yes to everything. That's very different than in the empathizing and defining stages being yes and in our mindset to encourage uh, ideas to come out. Because what we're after is that innovation sweet spot that we talked about. A product or service or process is desirable because we designed it from the start with empathy for our customers, our users, our constituents, whatever uh, pronoun you use to describe the person or people that are going to be consuming or interacting with, with your innovation. We can always adjust viability and feasibility with enough dollars and cents, but desirability is what we're um, often missing in linear and in idea thinking um, processes. So we also put some tools in your design thinking toolbox to get there. We introduced you to the empathy map canvas, which you'll recognize the one that's kind of in the background is sort of the, um, the official from the publishers of empathy uh, of um, a business model generation. There's many versions of that map. You can hand draw that map. The idea is not as much that it is the, uh, the perfect um, map as it is that you've gone through the concept of practice. The other thing we did was um, a definition statement. You'll remember we practiced listening to the people of Poynton in, in the UK as they described what life is like with transportation issues in the town. And that definition statement had some really important components. It was the name of the human that you're putting at the center of your design. It is the human that you have in the room, hopefully, when you're doing your empathy map, or at least you have, you know enough about that human that you can have a, you know, a stand-in or a poster or a picture with attributes um, that are important to that human as you're going through the empathy map. Uh, we have what that person needs or desires because you've worked through that empathy map, uh, especially those pains and gains really get you there. And what that person values, what pain, what, what are you going to solve for them or what are you going to remove of any pains? So one of the first questions was focusing on, that, that we focused on was these, the jobs to be done. You remember we talked about jobs to be done. And you remember the story about the home builder in southeastern Wisconsin. They came to us with a problem in their business. Their product, these pre-designed homes, was being customized by customers too frequently and too late in the process. It was frustrating for the builders. Uh, customers didn't like the idea that, that you know, the cost um, was, in their minds, was, was sort of hidden, even though most people know that when you make customizations to something that um, that, that, that started out as a model home, it's going to cost you um, money. And what they hadn't done is asked what the experience was like for their customers beyond the simple dollars and cents, like we talked about understanding that, that it costs more. And once we worked through the empathy map, remember with the intention to help them figure out if, if, what the design was in their product or in their service, once we worked through the empathy map, and learned that many of the customizations were to accommodate something of sentimental value, uh, a father's grand piano, a grandmother's china cabinet. We not only designed a better experience for customers, but we fundamentally changed their, their vision statement. So there was a question in our first session, does this affect your vision statement? Does this, what, you know, you, does this change your vision statement? It could. We're not saying that that's what you're set out to do, especially in uh, well-developed or well-established companies, not necessarily, but in this case, that is what happened. They came to us looking for, 
you know, a, a, a product design and a service design. And by going through the empathy map, they realize that we're not just in the in the business of building, um, you know, uh, these these pre-designed homes. We're moving lives to create new memories. When so they they not only change the way they interact with their customers, but they also ended up changing their vision statement. Okay, so don't feel that that's what you have to do. It's just an example to make sure that. If anything, I think it reinforces the cyclical nature of design thinking that it might even go back to your vision and your and your and your mission statements or your, your even the values um, that you have built that um, that you find that these things uh, sort of emerge when you when you empathize um, with with your constituents or your clients and you have them at the table with you. Okay, so we're moving on to the next phase. That's enough of, um, of a summary of a review. Let's move on to the next stage, ideation or ideate. This is where we generate ideas for achieving the human-centric design statement. So we have a definition statement. Now we have to figure out how, how are we gonna meet this? What are all the different ways and, and how are we going to do that, okay? So here's where we need that sheet of paper. Um, trying to find one myself because uh, I, I get to cheat. I don't actually have to do the exercise. But if you turn your paper sideways, that's probably going to be the easiest way to do it. And it's okay if it's a small sheet of paper, even um, like something this size is okay too. You just have smaller circles. Okay. What I want you to do is draw um, 30 circles, just as you see them here on um, on your sheet of paper. Now, I had a guy in a session try this once and he held his paper up to my screen and traced it with a Sharpie and ended up bleeding through on his screen. So please do not do that, okay? Don't try to trace your screen because this doesn't have to be perfect. We just need 30 I circles. On the screen. Right. Yeah, use your stylus if you have a if you have a Microsoft Surface, you can use your stylus and do that. But only that's not a shameless plug either for Microsoft Surface. Okay, so um, I'll give you a minute or so um, to finish getting your grid of thirty circles because I don't want you to feel like you're under any pressure to get this done quickly. Is it okay if uh, mine aren't as pretty as yours? Of course, I get to cheat because mine are computer generated. You bet. So perfection, perfection is not the key to this, right? I mean, we're not looking for perfection. No. I got 30 right. circles. They may not be equilateral in size or equal yeah. in size. But... Right. <laughs> okay, good. All right. So we'll, um, we'll go ahead and practice this exercise because even if you're not done, um, we can take some of the time from the actual exercise as well to get you those 30 circles, okay? So here's the objective. And if you've done this before, that's okay. Don't, I want you to still go through it because if you've done it before, you might also know sort of what the outcome is. And this is gonna be a good opportunity for you to, um, to stretch and, and be bold beyond, um, beyond what you've already tried, okay? So what we want you to do is I'm going to set a timer on my official timekeeping device. And we're going to, I want you to turn as many of those blank circles that you just drew, turn as many of them as possible into recognizable objects in three minutes. Okay, that's all the instruction that we're giving you. And I'm going to mute my side of the line. So it's nice and quiet for you. 30, 30 circles into as many uh, recognizable objects as possible. Ready, set, go. Does the rule suggest they need to be distinctively different? That's all the rules you're going to be given. Turn as many as you can into recognizable objects. Okay, time's up.
Pencils down. <laughs> Pens down. Okay. So let's do the big reveal. Let's do the big reveal here. Um, oh, go ahead and show. Everybody's laughing. They're like, "Are you kidding me? I'm no artist, right?" And that's okay because you don't have to be an artist for this exercise. There's no judgment here. Uh, okay, so big reveal. If you want to hold up to your cameras show us your 30 circle exercise. Let's see some of these results nice and close to the cameras. I gotta look at my grid. Okay, okay, I see them. Look at those, a lot of smiley faces. I see some sports balls in there. Is that, a, that there's a car, couple of vehicles, snowman, peace sign, very nice. What else, let's see, I don't have my full grid on. Okay, there we go. Nice. Okay, so does anybody want to, anybody want to volunteer just to kind of talk us through how you went through this exercise? Um, just, you know, tell us what you ended up with. Can you describe for us what was going through your brain? Were you feeling pressured because uh, you didn't know what the rules were? Uh, we'll get there in a second, right? Anybody willing to share with us a little bit about, about their results? Tell us about it. I, I can her. share. Go ahead. Oh, oh, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, sure. So I, you know, felt a tiny bit of pressure. Three minutes didn't seem like enough time to complete 30 circles. However, then I decided to take a simple route of things that I, that I like and enjoy looking at. So I chose a lot of smiley faces and sun rises. And then I thought I could create little people with very different uh, facial expressions and things, but, but I'm not an artist. So they're mostly stick people. So I went right. for something very simplistic, but that I, that seemed to be easy to me. Okay. All right. And was it Jeff that wanted to share too? Yeah, for me, it was, this was interesting because I had moments of inspiration. You know, I, the <laughs> simplicity, I took, I kept it very simple, but then all of a sudden, you know, I, I, when I felt that pressure, but then I would do a few, like the, the smiley faces and the peace signs. And then, then I thought, well, there's a sun, I could do a sun. And then I, I thought of ideas. Once I became relaxed, then my kind of my right brain kicked in and the creativity, yeah, yeah. the creativity started to flow a little bit and I became less, less anxious. And so I thought yeah. of like a potato head, <laughs> like Mr. Potato right. Head or Mrs. Potato Head or whatever. Um, right. And I couldn't draw them though. I mean, then, then I became, then my limiting factors came in of my artistic ability, but I had some interesting thoughts. So it was kind of inspiring. That's good. Yeah. And I love how you um, wove in there in your description, some of the brain science too, that goes behind it, because um, it's definitely what was, ha you know, the kinds of things that happen when it, when it comes to um, the creative process. And I think, you know, one of the other things that when I first went through this exercise, um, you know, you both uh, acknowledge that three minutes didn't seem like very long, you know, you felt this pressure. And then it's interesting, because at about minute two, your body sort of says, and your mind sort of says, are we done yet? Like this three minutes feels longer um, when you're in the process than it did when you were first told you had three minutes to do something, right? And so I think it's also another sort of reminder for us that, um, that sometimes, you know, you can almost, especially when you get in the creative process, you can almost suspend time a little bit um, because you you don't have to feel um, that pressure when when those thoughts kind of start um, that just start coming um, regardless of the of the time. Okay, good. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, one point. I think uh, uh, Diana has a comment which you may want to talk about. She says, "I began on ideas. I got stuck when I wasn't perfect." Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that reminder. So two things. Um, both of you also kind of acknowledge that you're not a great artist, right? And so between perfection and not being a great artist, when we are talking about design thinking as a process or just design in general, uh, those kinds of things, we're not, we're not worried about perfection. In fact, 
if you waited so long for uh, the perfect product, the perfect design, the perfect, perfect, perfect to come out, you might never get it out on, um, it, it might never see the light of day. And remember, perfection is in the eye of the beholder as well. So if your version of per per perfection is much higher than either the market or the world or your constituents or your whatever's are expecting it to be, again, it will never come out. Now, there are, of course, instances, there are um, situations, there are markets where, you know, Six Sigma of, uh, 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 you know, your flawless, your perfect has to be built into design. We get that, okay? Um, and, and we obviously have to, you know, make sure that we're, we're doing perfection in the places where they need to be. But for the most part, when we're in this session and when we're in the early stages of design, we don't worry about perfection because you're going to come back and relook at your designs. You're going to come back and relook at these ideas. And oh, by the way, if you have diversity of thought and diversity of skills and diversity of expertise in the room, bring an artist when the time is right. And that artist will take the stick figure and turn it into an actual human being. And I don't mean just in your 30 circles, because this is um, just a, a representative exercise. But when you're actually turning that product into something and it has to have more than stick figure-esque things to it, there's always um, time and people and, and resources to be able to do that. Okay, so good. Um, thank you for that. So let's go through this because what we were actually practicing, and, and by the way, um, count up how many circles um, you, turned, you, you turned into something. Um, and just, um, uh, you know, think through we, when you had 30 available to you, uh, it's quite interesting when you, when you realize how many you actually turned into something. So I'll take you through sort of, um, my uh, couple of times or few times that I did that. And I recreated these examples for you so that we could, we could share them with you here on screen. So what we're, what we're really um, trying to bring out for you is this idea of convergent and divergent thinking. And each of you um, from the examples that I saw on screen did uh, some of these things, okay? So in the first picture here, like Arlene, I started with things that I like. I like sports, so I started there. It, I have my own affinity bias to sports. And uh, once I ran out, with, ran out of sports ideas, I con so, so I converged on sports, but once I ran out of sports ideas, I diverged into emojis. I, I went to someplace faster and, and broader and uh, and, and, and decided to go into emojis, but, and then I converged there and I stayed there for a while and did as many of the emojis as I could think of. Let me give you another example. In this example, I diverge into the idea of, wait, uh, nobody said I couldn't combine circles. So we were, Jeff was asking for rules before, right? And I, I, uh, didn't mean to be so, uh, so unresponsive to you, but there was a reason for that. I didn't set any rules other than told you 30 circles, turn it into as many objects, whether they had to be, whether you could just turn them all into letters or if you could combine them. That is exactly how the creative process should work. We don't want to set too many rules if we don't have to, okay? So I diverge into the idea of combining the circles. How can I do that to get as many covered as possible? And then I stayed there for a while. I converge a little on my water and carbon dioxide molecules. Um, but you can see that this is an example of where I sort of broke what I thought the traditional rule was and I just combined them. And I saw some of those in your designs as well where you had you know, the vehicles and, um, and that kind of thing. And then likewise here, I said, I, you're not, I'm gonna cover as many circles as I can, and I'm gonna just make a box car from a train, right? And didn't really need to, um, to, to think about the circles as individuals, but brought them and, and grouped them all together. So the point here is your brains, without even me giving you the rules, your brains both went through convergent and divergent thinking when you were coming up with this, these ideas. This means we also need to train our brains to keep doing that. 
And, it, and when we get stuck in a divergent or a convergent situation, it's to surround ourselves with people who also think differently with the yes and as we go, because we're still in ideation stage, we don't have to say, well, that's a dumb idea, right? We don't have to do that yet. Um, it, and this also reminds us that there really aren't any rules when you can interpret and create and innovate and bounce ideas off of each other. Okay, so good practice. Thank you for going through that um, exercise. This is a good one to sort of um, warm up a, a group of people uh, when you're working through uh, your own design sessions as well. One of the most important things we wanna make sure is that we don't censor ourselves in this process. We're going for quantity, not quality. We're not going for perfection. We're going for quantity of ideas because there's a good chance that even in your stick figure-esque images or anything else that's imperfect, somebody will not only attempt to make it better, but they may even say, huh, I've got another idea that is based on your stick figure of what we can do here. The more ideas you have, the more diverse your thinking potentially is. And, and again, you, you know, there may be some things, I, I know there's candy in this picture that I don't like, but, that, but it may be something that somebody else likes, okay? So bring it into focus, start crazy and divergent, but bring it into focus on what's practical, fits the dimensions, fits the speed of what you're looking for, and that's how we begin to go on to hone in on these ideas. But we also want to stretch and be bold and reach with those ideas as well. Uh, and that's hard to do in idea first thinking, that's hard to do in linear thinking. Because we start, we, we think that that's the path that we have to go with and be successful with, okay? So one of my favorite all time inspirational videos when I need to be thinking bold is moonshot thinking. So if you've seen this video before, that's okay because it's worth seeing again. It gives you all the feels. If you haven't, um, I think you'll enjoy this video here. Let me make sure that I get this on full screen for you guys when I do this, okay? So give me just a second. The actual moonshot is wonderful, inspirational, poetic, beautiful, involved, great technical challenges, genuine heroism. It brought the world together. But think about the Polynesian Islander on the dugout canoe, deciding one day they were going to go that way. No one had ever been that way before. No one even knew if there was anything that way before. It was amazing, and it changed the world. People can set their minds to magical, seemingly impossible ideas, and then through science and technology, bring them to reality. And that then sets other people on fire, that other things that look impossible might be accomplishable. Galileo is such a hero, you know, in thinking big, and what he represents to me is both curiosity and wonder that humanity had that he had that pushed him and drove himself to invent and work on the first telescopes that allowed us to see the moon and here we are these aviation pioneers were, were figuring it out as they went no one really knew how to build an airplane right no one knew how to fly an airplane it was amazing and crazy and wonderful and they wanted to explore many years ago the great british explorer george mallory who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it? He said because it is there. There's so many challenges in the world, and you can feel daunted by that, you know, and sort of oppressed by that, or you kind of say, how might we think differently about this? Everyone else in the world is working on the next 10%. If you can be the one that delivers that 10 times improvement, you have a chance to really change things. If you want cars to run at 50 miles per gallon, fine, you can retool your car a little bit. But if I tell you it has to run on a gallon of gas for 500 miles, you have to start over. You need a lot of courage in this work and you need a lot of persistence. One of the things that's really critical is not only have the courage to keep trying every day or thinking big, even if you don't really 100% believe it's possible, like you might think this might be possible. Have the courage to try. That's how the greatest things have happened. You don't spend your time being bothered that you can't teleport from here to Japan. 
because there's a part of you that thinks it's impossible. Moonshot thinking is choosing to be bothered by that. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Humanity's progress has been a series of amazing, audacious things from the very small and personal up to the great, big, and grand. And we are a species of moonshots. And to me, that's like the really amazing, poetic, and inspirational thing. I think our ambitions are a glass ceiling on what we can accomplish. When you find your passion, you're unstoppable. You can make amazing things happen. It's been true through all of history. I believe in the human spirit, and I believe that there are always going to be crazy people who will get out of bed one morning and say, you know what? I think I can build a space elevator, and we'll just go and do it. But I think that if we become afraid to take these great big risks, we stop inspiring people. We stop achieving things. And the biggest nightmare scenario is that we won't have what it takes to solve the really big challenges. When Kennedy said that we would put a man on the moon, it's about the fact that he said, we don't know how to do this yet, and we're going to do it anyway. And that sense chills up everybody's spine. Because if that happens, what couldn't we do? Okay, what do you guys think? Did anybody get the goosebumps? The goosies? Yeah, absolutely. That was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, you bet. Um, there's a reason why I keep this one in my favorites. There's a reason why, selfishly, I use it when I get into those moments of, uh, I'm running out of, out of steam, out of energy, right? And um, this whole idea of why aim for 10% if you can aim for 10x, if you can aim for something bigger and broader, right? And sometimes, you know, I know these inspirational videos can sometimes feel, again, sort of heavy and daunting, like, but, but my idea is not going to take us to the moon. But again, that's not the point, right? That's not my innovation. It's not about whether your innovation is going to take us to the moon. It's about understanding that with inside of your space and with inside of that innovation, there is, it's just math. There is 10% of that uh, market. There's 10% of that idea. And there's 10x of that. Whatever that is with inside of your market, whatever that is in the area that you're that, that, that you're looking to serve, whatever that is within your constituents, figure out what the, what the difference is between 10% and what 10 times that is. And that's the kind of space that we want to create for that um, divergent thinking, especially. Okay. All right. So, that? yes, please, please, please. So... Um, the, the, the discussion today is about the, the big, right? It's about the getting out of your box and that kind of thing. But in the reality of the world, there's that. And then there's also the pragmatism of step-by-step, -step, right? Yeah. So like the lean concepts of Toyota, everybody heard of Toyota? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so it's a little bit, you know, every single day ends up with that 10 right. times over time. So, you know, right. it, both, both approaches have opportunity. Is all my point. <laughs> absolutely. No, absolutely. And that, that is, um, that's exactly how we um, talk about this with, you know, in, when we're in these workshops with, with people as well. Um, there's inspiration, right, as we know, and there's these, uh, okay, where, even, even as you think about, um, you know, as you think about putting together strategic direction for, for a company, there's the five year, the 10 year, vision and goals and and then there's the okay how are we actually going to get this done what are we going to do every single day uh to 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 get there um the, what we want to make sure that we're doing in that process is coming back and checking um because this original vision statement may 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 no longer be valid or this original 10 times or this original because of what we're doing every single day so we want to go back and, and check that as well. So yes, there's inspiration and perspiration as they say, right? And so there's the things yep. that we have to do every single day to systematically make progress. Um, we can't just completely walk around with, uh, with only this, um, this, this one inspirational vision in mind. Anything else, any other reactions to that? Well, I mean, I'm just thinking 
and I don't know if this really fits in to where we're at right now, but the kids, the kids need to believe, you know, believe that they can, they can achieve. Um, I think there in today's world, it's, there's this COVID heaviness, this, and yeah. the kids are fragmented and they need, it's going to be even more difficult for them to believe that they can do something like this or go, right. go do the 10 X rather than like the 0.05%. <laughs> right. So. I, I just wanted to come and, and, and tied into COVID as well, that a lot of companies may have thought that they had their, you know, directive set and they knew exactly where they were going, but the world has vastly dramatically changed in the last six months. Yeah. So they really do need to revisit strategic vision and, and planning and these kinds of, that this approach is, is really seems to me a great way to, to get to jumpstart and kickstart and then move into other ways to, you know, examine where you want to take the company or your business in the future. And, but the inspirational part I think is really, really important as well. Yeah. And, um, and it definitely, I agree with you. We hear from a lot of organizations that um, this whole idea that this, that, that, the pandemic has presented a challenge like nothing that they had anticipated and um and and just trying to imagine their business or their idea uh in in a normal world in whatever that normal world was and then being forced to imagine reimagine that um in this situation yeah is is you know, difficult. And that's something that we both need to inspire and, and remind us that it's, it's possible and then also get to the reality of how, right? Okay, so let's, um, let's stay on this idea of, you know, this, this crazy audacious goal. When, when Google first dreamed up ideas in the smart wearables market, one of the most promising of them, at least from Google, was a pair of smart glasses that would allow you to live in both like this virtual world, but also in a hands-free world with technology, but also not impair your vision like the way um, other virtual reality sets on the market do. So it was like this, how do we delicately combine virtual reality um, without blocking vision or without having a phone in front of our face and, and, and be a danger to society when we're walking, uh, uh, walking or driving with technology in front of our face. So what Google was after was something that you could read your email, watch YouTube or uh, scroll through your contacts or make a video call with somebody um, with an onboard, onboard camera. And you could even make a video call showing people, you know, what you were seeing through your goggles um, through this. And it was, they were trying to answer this question of how might we make virtual reality easy and convenient for everyday use. Now, these are pictures on the left of early prototypes. So in their prototype and in their ideation, they started with, you know, duct taping a phone on a set of uh, safety goggles and wiring it all up so that you could actually um, you could actually accomplish this original idea, and what they eventually released is on the far right. It ended up being sort of a buggy beta version of Google Glass. They released it in 2013. It really wasn't well received due to the style, um, but also the privacy and functionality concerns of this idea that somebody might be walking around with these glasses on and they could be recording something you don't necessarily know whether they're on or off um, and what they're doing with that. So after a lot of confusion surrounding whether the product was an experiment or a finished product, uh, the Google officially pulled it off um, the market. They pulled the plug on smart glasses in 2015. Well, guess what? Glasses back, baby, with all new focus. Get it focus uh, and it's coming to a workplace near you. So what we're going to do today is practice help. We're going to practice the ideation stage while we help Google 
uh, as if they need our help, right? But we're gonna help Google improve the design of its smart glasses for use in the workplace, okay? So this is actually an example. What I like about this example is we're taking a product that already exists in the marketplace uh, or once existed, right? When it was first released. And we're saying, okay, it's time. And, and Google is, uh, you know, one of those companies that's adopted design thinking. They pulled that thing back off the market and they're bringing it back out. Now, I'm sure they've already figured out how they're going to, to bring it back out because it is, it, it is available, but we're gonna take this opportunity to sort of pretend that we're in the room with Google, figuring out how this product um, is going to be used in the workplace, okay? So what I want you to do, um, grab that sheet of paper or another uh, clean sheet of paper or post it. Usually when we're in a workshop, we would use sticky notes because the nice thing about sticky notes when we're in actual, um, you know, either physical workshops or even uh, digital sticky notes if we have to, is there's this feeling of, um, some, some of it is just the, the uh, imperfection of the idea. The idea that you have to, draw something or come up with something on a three by three um, piece of paper uh, is meant to sort of say it doesn't have to be perfect, right? Just jot something down. And, and if you don't like where you go, uh, throw it away, right? That, that is the um, physical embodiment of this idea of your, your um, whatever you're writing down or whatever ideas in your head doesn't have to be perfect, okay? So without any additional context, I just want you to grab either three sticky notes or just uh, your sheet of paper and draw or try to draw, right? Draw your first three ideas. W how could somebody use these uh, virtual reality, but yet not completely covered over them? So imagine yourself or others in a workplace using these and what could they be used for? What could, what could you do to this product to make it uh, work in the workplace? Okay, I'll give you a few minutes, just like we did last time, for your first three ideas that come to mind. Okay. We'll stop that timer. All right, so again, big reveal. Anybody either want to show on screen or talk us through um, one or more of your first ideas without any other context? What are your first ideas for how might we bring Google Glass back out and make it work in the workplace? There you go. Yes. Somebody has to, hey. Yeah. Uh, so in the workplace, you know, like manufacturing instructions on a line, you know, uh, assembling mm -hmm. things and stuff, um, maintaining or servicing devices, be it your car or something in a manufacturing plant. Uh, if you're in a restaurant, teaching people how to cook, the recipes are right there. Uh, if you're a technician, you're on the phone, the person on the other end having their glass to be able to see what's in front of them so you can see in yours mm -hmm. what they're seeing. Um, I wrote down the grandma program and the VCR kind of idea. <laughs> nice. Lots of others, but those things. Cool. Cool. Okay. So you had a lot of divergent thinking into, I've, if I've got the technology, where are the different professions and the different roles, right? Okay. Anybody else? I had, um, I'm in the banking industry, and I thought about training artificial, I'm considering this as artificial intelligence, and in the training arena, as, as we think about how do we respond in, you know, building relationships with clients and things like that in a more personal way, and we have some, a lot of training in banking, and it could be very much more interesting, <laughs> I think, if, if you know, it's so web-based, if we had a different approach to how we, we did training. And how I was established. Yeah. I also thought about young children learning how to ride a bike. If you could go through a training session with, in advance, and giving them a feel of how it feels, versus then just popping them on the bike, and then you know, I mean, there a little preparation, if you will. And then also in the in with students in school, how about creating a project in China, but just sitting in your living room and having these really cool glasses to help you see the world in, in, in maybe a different way or, or create things differently. 
Yep, very cool. So Arlene, Arlene, along with your, you kind of brought up the idea of bike. And I, yes. I'm thinking about utility. I'm thinking about safety. And oh, yes. we need to sort of get out and get outside of our, get out into nature, get out in the world. Um, I was right. I was driving this morning earlier, and I saw this biker, and on his, and he, they had on the helmet, they kind of had the go, the rear view mirror, so that they. Can I've see seen that. Him. I thought, well, how, I don't see that very often, but I think that might be very safe, and it might be useful. So the question is, how can we bring these glasses and make them more useful and accepted in in the world? Mm -hmm. So that's just a thought. Thank you. Thank you, you guys. You, you, we could have almost ended the session here, right? But, but I appreciate that the, that the, um, what you did, what you guys were just doing right now, um, is you were scampering and Karen introduced this in our first session and we knew that we wanted to spend, and that's what we're going to do is basically spend the rest of this session really um, sort of breaking this tool down um, for how it can help us in our divergent thinking. Because as you guys were all sort of empathizing with this idea, you were actually putting yourselves, even in the words as you were describing your ideas, you were saying, well, if I were somebody on a manufacturing floor, or if I were um, somebody that is, um, that is working as a teller in the banking industry and have to have, to have good customer service skills, you were empathizing with your audience and you understood their needs and desires because either you've been in them yourself or you've been around these people enough to at least understand it. And that's what, what's going to help you give, uh, uh, you know, direction for whatever that um, idea is. So the chances are you'll come up with one or two ideas you like, um, but you may even have something that you love. And the idea is if you go through all of these different possible um, ways in which the product um, could be thought of or could be used or could be changed. These are the kinds of things that we'll go through in Scamper. Um, let me give you uh, another example here. Um, well, oh, before I do that, before we go on to examples, one of the things that a lot of people will, um, they, they don't realize about Scamper is this actually comes from um, one of the you know most creative um, artistic uh, realms, which is in the music industry. So Scamper is what jazz players do when they're jamming a melody. If if any of you are familiar with jazz music or are are fans of jam, jazz music, you'll know what we're talking about. In, in fact, in one study by Johns Hopkins, they conducted MRI scans of the brains of jazz musicians. And they compared side by side when they were asked to play a memorized piece of music and then when they were asked to improvise with another musician that they had in the control room. And the scan showed that improvisation caused the parts of the brain responsible for self-censoring, self-monitoring to become less engaged. When they were improvising, they were not censoring themselves and they were not uh, monitoring their ideas. This goes back to a little bit of what Jeff was talking about when he was doing his 30 circles he was engaging different parts of his brain. So while jamming with fellow musicians, these jazz players were turning off the parts of the brain that could prevent them from generating novel ideas without restrictions. So I'm sure many of you have been through a situation, right, where you've sat there trying so hard to come up with ideas and you can't do it because you can't force it. When the stakes are higher and the brain is actively overthinking something, it can interfere with the processes that have become sort of routinized or causing your behavior or your performance to suffer. It's especially frustrating in environments where performance is measured on whether your idea succeeds or fails. Back in that linear thinking of if it fails, you're done, you're out, your idea is bad. That's why um, we, we want to challenge ourselves and our thinking to be much more circular in that process and we want to get comfortable with that. I know it's more brain science, but it might also explain why when we ask people where they get their, their best ideas, the most common answers we, are, we get are when they're in the shower, 
when they're blow drying their hair uh, or when they're, you know, driving their car. And, and I know it's kind of hard, kind of curious when you realize that you're not overthinking as we're driving 70 miles an hour down the road, right? You'd, you'd hope people are overthinking, but especially if you've been driving for many years, uh, the, even driving has become something that you're just, it's very routine for you, okay? So we often think of these uh, ideas when our brains are, are not having to overthink something, okay? So that's what Scamper does for us. It engages the creative side of our brain. And if you've ever met somebody that says, I'm not a creative person, the diehard Scamper practitioners will tell you tools like this can actually help to teach creativity, okay? It doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna teach you to be an artist, that's different, but it can help you to trigger that part in your brain um, that otherwise had been shut off before, okay? So each of these letters in Scamper stand for a way in which we want you to think about an idea and the questions that we want you to ask as you're thinking through that idea. So we're gonna practice this ourselves today. We're not gonna go through every letter, don't worry, um, but, we, um, but we want to do that in, in our real design sessions. Today, we're just going to practice it with a few of these letters. So what I want you to do is we're gonna start with the very first letter, substitute, S, S is for substitute. So they need our help to improve Google Glass design for its launch in the workplace. You already have three or four ideas that you jotted down. Take a look at those now. Is there any, take a look at those ideas or the ones that you heard from somebody else. Is there anything else that we could do with that? Could you, are there materials in the product that you could substitute or swap to improve it? What about rules? Rules about, you know, the way the, way the product is supposed to work. Could you change some of those rules? Uh, where else could you use, could you substitute this, um, could you use this product somewhere else or as a substitute for something else? Okay, so take a minute, look at those ideas, think about substitution, and we'll come back and see what you got. Yeah, so I'm in chat, so I guess I could watch those. Okay, um, prescription glasses, adjustable face size, attachable face mask included, Van Carson um, sent in some substitute in our chat session. What else, anybody on, on screen or on, um, on audio want to share with us how they answered some or, or, or one of these substitute questions? Well, I, I had additional ideas around learning how to ride a bike. I also thought about driving a car or, or other sports mm -hmm. activities where you learn how to do something, whether it's playing soccer or baseball or something, if there's a way to do that with these glasses to give you some training in the, when the weather is poor or, you know, anything, any other, any kind of sport activity, actually. Okay, pause there. What did Arlene do? she was she originally diverged right yeah where she's going what about bike how crazy would that be if we could teach and then what did she do converge she diverged yep she converged and she said okay so i diverged on this idea and now i if i if i subst if i look at it from a substitute concept of well i'm just going to substitute the activity of learning to ride a bike 
and replace it and converge. Okay, so both um, exercises that she did there. Okay. Um, fashionable frames, yeah, back on prescription glasses, funny, because that was the number one criticism of the product when it first came out was that it was not um, embracing the idea that somebody might have prescription lenses. And so this limited um, their market when they originally came out with that. If you, super secret, if you Google it now, there is a way that you can get prescription lenses put into these glasses if you're going to be using them in the workplace, okay? So you're right on track with just, again, that whole, whole concept of substitute. Okay, anybody else wanna share one before we move on? Okay, we'll go with computer glare and readers. Yep, all, all these, good, good substitutes. Okay, let's move on to our next one. Um, and again, oops, hold on, I gotta bring my screen back up here. Okay. Um, the next one is combine. So we're not gonna practice this one, but some examples of questions. And, and by the way, as usual, right, the video's available. You can Google um, Scamper as well, and you'll see lots of different questions that you can ask in any of these. We're just giving you samples of the types of questions that can really help to prompt these, okay? So in combine, we look at what if you combine the purposes or objectives? How could you combine talent and resources to make this product even better? Uh, in adapt, what else is this product like? Uh, what, uh, what other products or ideas could you use to get more inspiration from this? Where else have we seen uh, wearables? You know, in some, for something like this, for, for um, sort of this futuristic or disruptive technology, it, when you're thinking about, um, you know, virtual reality, you might get ideas, I know it's crazy, but from watching futuristic movies, right? Um, not because you're trying to, again, uh, turn the world into robots necessarily, um, but maybe, but that gives you ideas and that gives you uh, inspiration for other contexts about where you could adapt the product. Okay, this one we're going to practice together. So. Uh, another opportunity um, on, on your sheet of paper. The M stands for a few different things sometimes. You'll see it either stands for modify or magnify or what sometimes is called affectionately minify. So magnify is how might you, what could you emphasize or highlight that really creates value um, for this product or service. Whereas minify is sort of what could you what could you sort of subtract? What if this idea of what if what if our product has like too many features? Okay, what if we thought of our product in a way where we subtracted something? Okay, so what I want you to do is practice now. Go back to those examples. Go back to the ideas that other people shared and start scampering off of those ideas. Start improvising off those ideas. And I'll give you a minute to think of um, some of these questions on modify, magnify, or minify, okay? Okay, how are we doing? Ideas. What did this make you think of now? 
what did modify, magnify, or minify? Where do you go with your idea next? Anybody want to share? Jeff says, creating contacts that communicate with the glasses. Oh my gosh, do you mean contact lenses? Yes, how about that for minify? We're wow. and this got this communication. I mean, we're at a new level at that point. Uh huh. Uh huh. With AI, very and intriguing. With just yep. unbelievable. It's just very good one. It's very kind good. of mind boggling. Yeah. Actually. Well, contact lenses are being um, so. You're you're doing a couple things, which I love about this, Jeff. You're doing almost a combine and a minim minify, you know, together, right? There's that's a, that's okay. This is not a perfect science, right? And, you know, contact lenses are becoming, you know, have the capability in some cases of determining like what your, um, what your blood sugar levels are. And is there a way that, you know, those, that, 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 that information can be used differently, right? Okay. Um, Karen says add a microphone. Okay. So that we can actually, we can pick up on the sound, right? Um, one of the things I, one of the things I thought of when I was going through this as well is, you know, if you look at those glasses right now, do you notice that there, there's because of the design, um, especially if we think about using them on a shop floor, they have to be safe, right? They have to have safety um, in in mind. And there's different versions of them, and there's different um, there's different modifications already out there, but. What that made me realize is you can't necessarily take that safety factor away to protect the eyes. So what if you magnified the fact that, look, I just took that away from you, which affects your peripheral vision if you're on the shop floor. So what if the image that I'm putting in front of you on the camera or that little eyeglass gives you your peripheral vision back, okay? So we could modify it so that what I can't see in front of me can now, um, I, can, I can see that uh, uh, next to me, okay? Okay, Van says modify your smartphone. Okay, good, good practice. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, we're going to practice again with this one. We've already done some of this, okay, and that's okay because we still are going to ask that clinical question of who else could use this product now that because what you just heard was other ideas on how to modify. Now, based on what everybody said on how to modify, what it, what else now has this made us think of? What other um, product or industry, or how could it behave differently in a different setting? Any additional ideas on putting it to other use? Uh, I had been, it actually, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of going back to the last category of minifying. And Jeff had talked about safety training and we were specifically referring to bicycles, but, but I was thinking about industry, you know, business, all sorts of sports activities. There's so many applications where you could take safety training and really hone in on it very, very specifically. So that's, I think the other use is, is, is very significant. All the different ways you could um, really target safety training in a very you know, useful way. Yeah, you know what that made me think of is like, uh, you know, the old days before you had Google Maps, um, you know, the way you remembered, at least for me, the way it was easiest for me to remember how to get someplace was to be in the driver's seat while somebody else was giving me the, the, the directions. It was harder for me to remember if I was just the passenger in the vehicle. And so with Google Glass, your idea of why, why don't we train and teach safety while you're doing the task instead of sitting down in front of your computer learning about safety and then expecting to go out and apply it, right? And so you're, That's you're great. putting it to use, you're combining, you're modifying, you're magnifying this idea of mm -hmm. uh, safety training real time in the moment while you're doing the task, mm -hmm. right? 
Uh, mm -hmm. Diana sends in an idea over chat. She says the deaf community could use this. Wow, powerful, right? Um, there, you know, artificial intelligence is getting so sophisticated to the extent that, you know, the ability to be able to convert somebody's voice voice into words, somebody's facial expressions into that. How might that? Um, how might we be able to bring that forward for somebody that is that is hearing impaired? Remember my industrial engineer example from you know the shop floor and Jeff you alluded to this earlier in your very first without even going through scamper one of your very first ideas was that whole idea that wait we just yes ended the work instructions so Lee the industrial engineer took it from paper to Google Drive Google Glass can take that from Google Drive and having to be at a workstation to read the digital instructions to putting those instructions right in front of their face. And then you combine that with um, with Arlene safety and you've got a pretty, um, pretty compelling um, product opportunity. OK, good. Good practice. The E starts for or stands for um, eliminate. Um, this is actually one of my super secret. This is actually one of my favorites. I emphasized it before, but I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. Uh, you know, sometimes when, um, and, it, and, and especially when it's your idea, it takes somebody who's willing to say, what if you simplified this for a second? What if you understated or if you toned down something? Um, what if you weren't trying to solve so many things but you just you 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 actually use the benefits of subtraction of of your idea. It doesn't mean that 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 it that your your product permanently would do that. But what it's meant to do is how could you imagine your product or your service uh, in a much simpler, smaller, faster, lighter space? One of the benefits that sometimes results from this is where you. Um, where you do get these lighter versions, where potentially your product has diverse applications and you didn't even think through this idea of, huh, there might be a light version of this product that I offer both to the market. Okay, there's the heavy or there's the full price or there's this full service model and then there's this light model. And all of a sudden you're in a market or you're in a uh, demographic that you didn't even originally think about. Um, the, these people that can help you think through eliminate are so valuable sometimes that it just kind of depends on the product or service. So uh, like I said, I really like um, eliminate as, as one of those challenging sets of questions. And then the last one, the R stands for, um, sometimes you'll hear it uh, for reverse or rearrange. And let's practice one more time with this. Okay, so what would happen if you if you reversed this product or you, if you did the exact opposite? Oh my gosh, another fun one to think about. If this product was designed to go into the workplace to help us with, with one thing, what if you did the exact opposite with it? Or what components could you substitute? What could you, you know, add on or reverse or rearrange about this product? Uh, really think through this one. Give it, I'll give you a minute on this one for the reverse and rearrange practice. Saeed just chatted it on the eliminate one. Google just released Gmail Go, which is the light version of Gmail, right? So it's like they eliminated uh, something from that. It, just when you thought email, you know, couldn't get any easier, right? And they, there still is a way um, to introduce elimination there. Good. Keep going on reverse and rearrange.
Yeah, the GF is a very good one at project to show this. Yeah, rearrange and reverse, Jeff. Yeah, smaller on the head, like great, but what if I don't want to wear glasses? Like, is there a way we could e make it even smaller? Cool. Any other ideas for reverse and rearrange? One of the things I thought about, <clears throat> by the way, you can take reverse and rearrange quite literally in some cases. And that's what I was doing. I was thinking in what workplaces or professions would having eyes in the back of your head, literally reversing, like taking those glasses and putting them backwards, how nice would that be? Like, where where could I, I wish I had eyes in my back of my head as a mom, as a babysitter, as a basketball player? Like, I, you know, there's lots of, of ways. And so even though we might not literally expect that Google or anybody else takes the glasses and puts them on backwards, where what could we do with the existing product that faces forward to still give you backwards imaging? Anybody? Go go back to your idea of the mirror on the on the um, helmet of the bike rider. Okay, I I can't believe that we don't have a reverse camera yet. I know I have one on my car. Do you guys have a reverse the backup cam, right on your car? If you're operating a forklift that hasn't yet been equipped with a backup cam, because older forklifts don't have backup cam yet on board. Okay, so you're on a shop floor, you're wearing your Google Glass that's facing forward. As soon as you put it into reverse, because maybe it's talking to your, uh, to your forklift, it knows at least when it's in reverse or you tell it, Google Glass, I'm in reverse, and it turns on the back cam. Okay, think about that. Uh, Jeff, oh, back of boat trailer. Side note, if you haven't seen, some of the great videos of husbands and wives and spouses and family members trying to help each other back a boat up into uh, into the lake and or pull it out. It's some of the funniest, I don't know, it's pandemic video watching, I get it, but some of the funniest footage, right? Ah, police <clears throat> body cameras front, front and back. Um, an interesting social uh, dynamic we have going on right now with uh, with body cams. Good one. Okay, good job, you guys. Good practice. Um, we didn't go through every single one of them, but you can see how we took uh, one idea, the simple ideas that you that you all had, and we're just going off in all kinds of directions, right? Now the the frustrating things sometimes can be oh my gosh now i have too many ideas didn't you tell me that i was supposed to you know sort of stay focused and get something this is all part of the ideation cycle it's all part of the ideation process and it and it does not mean that you can't still get something out to market uh the yes anding and the um the and these the if if you know remember silicon valley you know, sort of uh, was very successful with design thinking because they were okay with the fact that the first time that you downloaded an app on your phone, it might be a little bit buggy. So we're going to come out with something else. We're going to update it. We're going to rearrange it, or we're going to fix some of those things, right? That's that kind of, um, that, that concept. Van reminds us <laughs> ideas are, are, are priceless, right? Um, they be, especially if if the ideas you did not have to invest a ton in at least getting them um because then if you can turn them into something that does have value uh that's when they're priceless right okay so uh what i thought we would do now is um what i'd like to do is give uh kieran an opportunity here um to to talk us through kind of we're going we're going to sum this all up here because we're we're right towards the end where I, what I want you to do is because we practice this on one on on you know kind of a hypothetically real uh, example of Google Glass 
But Karen has some great examples of where companies that um, you know are right here within our region have themselves practiced divergent thinking and scampered in different um, business models. So Kieran, can you take us through some of those examples for us? Uh, sure. So, you know, uh, we started this tech prize uh, initiative to bring back the glory days of our scene. I don't know how many people, uh, how many of you know that in the first half of the 20th century, were seen dominated with innovations. But really it started in 1904 by one person uh, uh, who, who still has, I mean, that family still has a property here in Racine called Horlicks. Horlicks is a very, very famous uh, malted drink in the world, not as much popular in the US, but recently the Horlicks in India was purchased by Unilever uh, for $3.4 billion. You can imagine how much that is, uh, uh, that has been popular in the world even today after 100 years. Uh, the concept of Harlix is really can be used to uh, talk about scamper. So James Harlix was a chemist. Uh, at the same time, he was also humanitarian and he he saw here in Racine, Wisconsin, we were producing a lot of milk, good quality milk. Actually, his brother had introduced Swiss cows over here in Wisconsin. So uh, we had a very ab abundance of milk. And at, at the same time, people in the developing world, the kids were not getting nutritious food. So he thought through and came up with the idea of eliminating the water out of milk, combining that with malt and sugar to create a health milk that can be easily transported. So he's applying this substitute combined adapt kind of uh, dynamics into this one concept of creating milk that is perishable into a product that can be delivered thousands of miles away uh, to people where they need it uh, at, after maybe even few months. So that was the first idea that started a wave of innovations in Racine. Around the same time, I know how many of you know the Andes, uh, uh, the, the company that makes hair clippers. Uh, that Matt Andes and John Oster, the guy who invented the blender, looked at uh, looked at one of the machines that was made by another scientist called uh, Stephen Poplowski when Horlick's family wanted to take this milk and, and malt powder and convert it back into a drink, they needed a stirrer, a mixer. So Poplowski came up with a motorized mixer. So that's how the whole mixer invention started. That further was taken and modified to put into other use, which is in the kitchen. But the problem was the motor used for that bigger mixer was not a right motor to uh, use in a kitchen. Oster at that time modified the uh, motor to become a universal small motor and then applied that to kitchen. At the same time, once this motor, once this scamper thing started going in Racine, Around the motor, there were many other inventions that came in. So for example, uh, you know the uh, handheld uh, drill that got invented over here. The original uh, inventor was uh, uh, Albert, uh, Albert Dremel, the Dremel tool uh, was the first tool where he took that motor and put it into a handheld device. So if you go and we, I can talk for a few hours on each of the different invention and how they're all linked with each other because all of these inventors were here in Racine. They're looking at talking to you, they're drinking beer with each other and taking the ideas and applying the scamper technique to come up with new innovation. Just 
passing remark over here is if you take this camp or each of this idea and apply to one idea, original thought that you could come with the combinations of these techniques, one idea can generate over 360,000 new ideas. So think of the power of this particular technique. Yeah, and it just, thank you, Karen. And it just reminds us that, you know, I, I, it took me, I had to go through design thinking. I had to be exposed to design thinking to break my own paradigm of this idea that innovation has to be something novel and new that nobody has ever thought of anything near it. It, and so this, you, you shut yourself down from the creative process when you think, well, I don't have any new ideas. Like that stuff is for Edison. That stuff is for, you know, whomever, somebody else that like pioneers and starts something completely new. Any artist will tell you that where they get their best ideas is from other artists, right? And that what they're trying to do is they see, oh my gosh, I really like what Kieran did there or I really like that, that concept, wouldn't it be nice if we could take that and apply it someplace else? That's uh, where, uh, where, this, where, the, where you unleash these opportunities and you build on the yes and of other people. So, so Karen gave you some great examples of, of how that even just happened in, 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 in scampered in one area. I have on screen here, I won't read through them. You can always come back to them, but they, these are probably very, um, you know, familiar situations where scamper is happening um, all around us. And a lot of these ideas really are just um, one of these letters, one or two of these letters um, combined into, into helping us get through um, these innovations. It would be interesting, uh, Sarah, to share the Gmail concept that came out of scamper in our own workplace. I don't know how many people, uh, how many of you know that Gmail that everybody uses. Uh, actually, Sarah was a project manager on that project uh, with us uh, when we worked at Diversity. So our team was the one who actually went to Google and say, actually, Gmail can be used in a workplace. So we were the actual creator of that idea that Gmail can be used in a workplace. When we had a problem. Sarah was part of the team at that time. and We had a problem. We had no money and our email system was crumbling. And then we started thinking through the exact same process of uh, Scamper uh, and, and we came up with the idea, hey, why, what if we could actually use Gmail in our environment? When I made that call, the the person at the end like stopped for a few seconds and within 20 minutes, I started getting calls from California uh, whether I was really serious about that. Six months after that, and Sarah was the project manager for that, we were the first company in, in the world to actually use Gmail as a corporate email. Yes, and because I didn't know he was going to go there. So I just want to, um, you know, further that story with, I did not think in that moment that we could somehow have an impact on a company like Google. I didn't, you don't imagine yourself when you're in the world and the box that you're in, that you could influence that. And it's because of that experience that when Google, when we showed them the industrial engineer's example on the shop floor in another company years later, we showed them that exact example. They said, wouldn't it be, or our engineer said, wouldn't it be nice if they could do this hands-free? Now I'm not saying that they're crediting Google Glass coming back out in the workplace because of us. But what I'm saying is, is it gave us sort of that, that real, the, it, I built on the real, realization from years prior that we had when we, when we were consulted as customers and when, when Kieran said, no, this is possible, 
to influence how another product or service could be brought into the workplace differently. So it's like, it, it's those kinds of moments and those opportunities really do stick with you. And it's because we have these bold ideas or it's because we have the willingness to bring those forward. Okay, so great example. Thank you for that. Um, we're gonna just wrap up today with one, um, one sort of homework or study assignment that, um, that, you, that, that we wanna encourage you to do because we gave you a divergent thinking. That was all of what we spent um, today's session on. And, um, and we did a little bit of converging as well, but we didn't do it in a clinical way. So we're not gonna actually go through this tool, but this is another one that you can, um, that you can research or that you can, um, that you can learn more about. We use this in our workshops when we're trying to take those, uh, we're, we're gonna refocus on convergent thinking. This is what, is go what gives you sort of that real critical look at, um, at, at an idea and it invites everybody to put on a different hat or a different way of looking at things. And this is the, you know, this is where things get interesting, especially in a group of people, because, you know, sometimes I think we find that we, it's really easy to judge other people's ideas, right? Um, and 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 sometimes we don't we don't we don't do that. We don't apply that um, on ourselves, right? And so. This, this is good when we have a, a, a collaborative group of people. Uh, it helps you get sort of remind yourself you can't be too close to your good idea. And so you can learn a little bit more about six hats thinking and, um, and this idea that we ask you to actually play a, cr uh, a critical role. We ask you to play an emotional role and we want you to emotionally react to the idea. So this is a good one for you to, um, to practice and learn about as well. Okay. New opportunity for our youth happening right here in Racine. Drawing on the innovation and bold ideas of Racine's past, Tech Prize is an 11 day event that will bring hundreds of entrepreneurs and innovators from around the country to downtown Racine. There's a lot of ways kids from elementary school up to college can get involved. They can compete for cash and scholarships by sharing their new idea or invention during the idea competition. Kids with coding skills can compete to solve problems or create useful apps in the coding competition. An eSports gaming competition will include cash prizes and entertainment as well. Internship opportunities, mentorship, tech, and business workshops are available throughout the event too. If you've got a kid with a specific skill or interest in one of these tech prize event fields, register and get them started in something that can change their future at techprize.org.